We are the waiting ones. Longing for the day to come when we are no longer waiting on the one who can save us from ourselves. Waiting with bated breath for hope to reach out its hand from heaven and heal our helpless hearts. Waiting for a light to spark, a light to dawn, a light to diffuse the dark we drawn like curtains over our souls. Waiting for the promise to unfold like a map leading us to the treasure of treasures so we can behold and believe. Waiting for peace to supersede our anxieties and flow like a river through a dry and weary land where there is no water waiting for the Father to see fit to find us in our pit, pining in our sin, the spiritual slum we lived in. But when the fullness of time had come, he sent forth his only Son, incarnate one, the manifestation of God in the flesh, the epitome of a promise kept. He left heaven's majesty so we no longer have to be waiting. The birth of a baby a king, come to redeem the world he created. God, born in a borrowed stable, the light of man in a makeshift cradle. This is not a fable. The one whom we have waited for is here. Peer into the manger and behold him who welcomes the stranger and breaks the chains of every captive. Our maker, our savior, our master is here, casting our fear into the ocean of his love. Emmanuel, God with us, go shout it on the mountain, cause our waiting is done. You know, I'm one of those people who sits around and thinks, and thinks, and thinks, and thinks. Sometimes my thinking just goes on and I forget what time it is after bedtime, you know what I mean? Any of you relate where, where your kind of brain won't always shut off right before bed? Put your hand up, it's okay. Let's admit this, yeah, we're all in this. Yeah, yeah, there's a few of us. Some of you have been blessed with this gift, and I, I would call it a spiritual gift, where when you go to bed, it's like your head is on its way to the pillow and you fall asleep as you fall into your mattress. And I don't know how that happens, but yeah, good job. Anyway, I'm not bitter. So. I, I end up at night just sort of thinking about things. And one of the things I think about when I'm thinking about the great mysteries of the universe and of life, I, I think, why can't the things that I want to happen, you know, those things that I hope for, those things that I want to take place, why don't they happen when I want them and how I want them? Anyone, anyone relate to this? You know, I think about even simple, well, we'll call this simple. I don't know if it's simple. But I, but I remember a particular 24th and on this 24th, we had been really kind of in a whirlwind of emotion, a whirlwind of experience. Because on the calendar, we had a due date. We believed that the 24th was the day that our daughter was going to be born. And so we, you know, we started having contractions. We, <laughs> I did not have contractions. <laughs> Let's be very clear about this. Lauren was having what we call contractions, early labor, all the stuff, you know, it's our first round of this. And it's the 24th and, and, and we finally think, okay, it's going to happen now. And so we're there at the hospital and we're there and we're there and we're waiting and we're waiting. And then midnight comes and now it's the 25th. And at 12.48 a.m., my first kiddo, Lydia, was born on the 25th. Now, for clarity, it was April, not Christmas. Some of you were like, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. It would have been a better story, probably. Well, then about five and a half years later, we're, we're blessed to, to be in this journey again, a little less pre-labor kind of stuff. It's a little smoother this time. 
And, but, but you've got to understand something because this time it was actually December. And so it's December and, and the whole time, Lauren is just saying, God, do not let this baby come out on the 25th. We prefer not the 24th, you know? And so we're just like, no, 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 this can't happen. Now, if you have a 25th birthday, bless you. May your parents give you double the bounty. But we, we were just like, you know what? We'd like to have some kind of separation. Well, it worked out. And so our Chloe was actually born on the 27th of December. So, hey, early this week, we get to have a party, right? But, but you know that feeling when you're, you're just anticipating and you want things to go a certain way and, and they kind of do and they kind of don't. And you wonder, why not? Well, I, I do know this, that the outcome of those two very different but very challenging circumstances which many of you have partaken in in your own way, I'm sure. It, it led to a lovely family, a, a lovely situation, something I couldn't have seen. In fact, here's a picture of us this year. Merry Christmas, yes. I know, I know. Friend from church actually took this picture. So if you need a photographer, hit me up. I'll tell you who that was. But, but it's like, you know, it would be nice if we could see that side of it, you know, the, the nice, the polish, the we got dressed up for this, you know, the outcome of the hope of having babies or having something in your life go how you hope it will. Be it children, be it goals, be it circumstance. Because we, we want that sort of sneak preview. But what I know is this, that in, in, in the waiting, in the longing, in the hoping, something fundamentally changed in our world as a family. Something fundamentally was world altering about our experience, even if the journey along the way did not feel like that. I mean, we sort of get this, right? We get what it's like for, for uh, to have this like dream that we want to come to fruition. And it feels like it, every step of the way is an almost, but not quite. Because life can be hard. Circumstances don't always go exactly to plan. And we sometimes have to ask the question, does God care? Does anyone see the struggle? And what I want to do is I want to invite us to think about one big idea tonight. And it's this. Even if the conditions aren't perfect, hope is here. Excuse me. Even if the conditions aren't perfect, hope is here. We're gonna see this bear out in the story of Jesus. This won't be a shock to many of you. If you've watched Charlie Brown, you know the story in the gospels and uh, that's awesome. But we're gonna really try and draw this idea of hope being here out together in the next 10 to 15 minutes together. Now, sometimes you find yourself, you've built something and you've made it exactly as it's supposed to be. I was listening to a story this week about a gentleman who used thousands and thousands of Legos and built his own Christmas tree out of them, right? Pretty amazing. He had to think that through, he had to strategize and he had to build, he had to buy so many Legos, so, so many green Legos particularly. And, and, and I can imagine if that were my Christmas tree and it came tumbling down, I would feel things. Maybe you would feel things. It's kind of like this. If, if you built a, how many of us built gingerbread houses this year already? Someone? Yeah. yeah. Mine is missing candy. But, but sometimes gingerbread houses don't go well. I mean, have you, have you seen this? Right? Like, like and, and, and we have to figure out how do we remedy the situation? You know? Like, is there something we can do to still find hope in this scenario? The house is falling down. The thing we made together is broken. So add a dinosaur, it'll be fine. But it might not be. 
And what's amazing about the story of Jesus is that the conditions were really imperfect. The conditions were hard. And yet, it's one of the most hope-filled stories the world has ever told, known, and it's still Christian, not Christian. It's a beautiful story. And so I want to jump into the text today, and we're going to be looking at Luke's version of the story. And I want to draw out just a few sort of nuggets about the conditions of the situation of trying to have the Savior of the world. So Luke chapter 2 puts it this way. This is verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. Let me, let me stop here and just highlight something for us. This couldn't be more inconvenient for Mary and Joseph. I mean, the timing is absolutely inconvenient. She's very pregnant, and this decree from this oppressive empire that has taken over your people's land, and it's just another empire in a list of empires that have been doing this to your people for hundreds and hundreds of years. The, the, the big boss there, Caesar Augustus, is like, hey, I want to make sure our count of our people is accurate because I want to make sure that we're taxing them a lot of money. Do you understand how this goes, right? So, so the timing of all of this is absolutely inconvenient. Couldn't be worse. She's pregnant. They have to travel. And the story just gets harder and harder. Verse 5 keeps going. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. So what about timing is rough, but also accommodations, right? So, so not only has their situation just had this terrible timing, but the accommodations are just lacking. You know, and if, if, I, if I were to just make up a story about God becoming a human being, which by the way, is a radical idea in and of itself, but if I were to just sort of make up that story, I think I would have written it in a way where God becomes human and it is epic, you know what I mean? Like God is just like from the, you know, the moment Jesus is born has like way more muscles than an average baby, you know? Like, like he, six pack is already there. I don't need milk, give me meat, you know? Like already talking, like, you know, like if I were to come up with this kind of a story, it would be way terrible, but it'd be way different, you know? But here, here we have this sort of like, hey, God is becoming human and the timing is terrible, and the accommodations are pretty much the worst. Now, you and I grew up with, and I, I mentioned this, I think, last year briefly, uh, but you and I grew up with translations of the Bible that would say, there's no room for them in the inn. Anyone remember that? And we have an innkeeper in some of the plays and all of that, but most translations now, like this is the NIV, pretty popular translation, when they've updated they've really highlighted something that the word there, I'm going to be nerdy, 30 seconds at most, kataluma, is a word that whenever it's used in the ancient world, whenever it's used, especially in the New Testament, has to do with a guest room of someone's home. How many of us may have a guest room? How many of you keep it nice and clean and it's always ready for your guests? <laughs> right? Maybe. If you do, you're epic. Yeah, good job. But let's look at a picture of this. This is the layout 
of a first century Jewish and or Palestinian home. And what you have actually, you can see here, is the guest room is like a pretty big space. So hospitality in the Middle East to this day is a huge value. And so everyone is ready to host someone. But when the census comes, a lot of people need that guest room. And so they show up and they're like, hey, pregnant, you know, sorry, the guest room is full, but we have room kind of on the edge of the family room and you can kind of hang there. And so they have their baby in that part of the house. And this is really a radical picture of one of two options we can really think about. One is, hey, we're going to make this work no matter what. That's a positive version, right? We're going to make this work no matter what. The negative version is, Mary, why are you pregnant? You're not even married yet. Like, I, I think about this and I'm like, whoever has the guest room, they better have some real deep, like, accommodations that are really important because if they don't, I would think the nine and a half month pregnant lady should win. Anyone? Right? Like, like, like if, if someone is in that state medically, we just know, like, hey, we're going to go out of our way to do everything possible. And so the negative way to read this story, and we don't know, we weren't there, but is to infer maybe there's some shaming happening because they're not quite sure what to do with Mary and Joseph's situation yet. Either way, the accommodations are utterly lacking. But I, I love what, this was actually a professor of mine in seminary, Tim Geddert. He, he has a great reflection on this. This is what he says. He says, a new reading of the text challenges us to open our own living rooms for Jesus, making room for him, not in the barn or once or twice church, <laughs> once or twice church services, or maybe Christmas Eve and Christmas morning, but in our living rooms, right where the family lives, where the pets roam, where we work and sleep and play and eat, even where our homes, when our homes are all, are packed full of guests. After all, they called him Emmanuel, God with us. The positive image here is that the conditions can be a mess. The, the accommodations can be totally lacking. But you and I, each year and each day of our lives, have the opportunity to say, God, you have permission to be in the mess and mingle of our normal lives. Come be here. It might not be convenient, but it's good. So, so good. The story, of course, continues. Verse 8 tells us that, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven. And on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. You know, the timing may have been rough. The accommodations may be lacking. But my friends, the announcement is world-altering. 
The announcement is absolutely world altering. Whenever in your life you can think of a time where you got some really good news that you knew was gonna change your circumstances forever, you understand how significant that can be and feel. The timing of it might not matter. The kind of the situation might be a mess, but when the news comes, it's like, oh, this is what it's actually about. This is what it's all about about your world, our world, altered forever. If we swap out that E for an A, our world is an altar, a space where God wants to dwell. And so what do we do with this world-altering news? How do we step into this? And, you know, I I wonder if you can just imagine, like, how has God altered your world, your life, your situation? If you're here, there's uh, many possibilities about why. One possibility is you're here because you're curious, you're interested, you're not really someone who would say, I'm a Christian or a follower of Jesus, but it seems interesting and fascinating. And if you're here and you're wondering what the core of the Christian message is all about, it's that God becomes human, shows us how to live the human life better than anyone ever could or will, gives up his life to heal the world on a cross, and three days later rises again to conquer all evil and death. It's world altering. And you're invited to join that movement. Pastor Pete was it, talking about just the ways we sort of have stumbled into some of that work here at Brentview. And so maybe you find yourself saying, you know what, I wanna know about this Jesus. You're welcome here. Many of us, this is news that we've been told over and over again, and we believe it, and we've received it, and we believe the hope is here. But Here's the challenge. Sometimes it's really hard to embrace that when things don't feel very hopeful. And so Jesus, I would say, invites us to ask, what do we need this Christmas? What do we need to know and experience to believe that hope is still real in 2022 and forward? And I think that it's very possible that if we sit and ponder that question, if we take some time to just ask Jesus, what does it mean that hope is here in my life right now? As diverse as the answers would be in this room, so also would be the diversity of the way your world would change as a result of hearing exactly what you need from God. Imagine if that was our posture as a church. Imagine if that was our posture as families, if that was our posture as people. If we said, you know what? Circumstances are hard. Life is hard. There's no getting around it. But even though conditions don't seem perfect, we have a savior who stepped into murky and challenging conditions and on the other side of it has saved the world and has changed human history for ever. This isn't just a Christmas pageant. This isn't just a cool idea. This isn't just a story. This is the inauguration of God's rescue mission for all of creation, and you have the resources you need. If you have come to faith in Jesus and are experiencing the life of God, you have all that you need to embody that hope in your small sphere of this world. And if we do that together, this world will be altered. This world will never be the same again. So may you find hope as you seek Jesus at Christmas. May you find that where conditions are hard, God sees you in the midst of it. And may we together proclaim hope is here because 2,000 years ago, that became the most real phrase that anyone could ever say. And my friends, it's the most real thing you could say in this moment. Hope is here. 
hope is here. Let me pray a prayer of blessing over all of us. And so God, we know that when you sent your son, the conditions were rough. Timing didn't make sense. The situation, the accommodations, it was just all messy. And yet, angels on a hillside proclaimed glory to God in the highest. Open our hearts and minds, Jesus, to see that this is still real for us today. Show us that hope is still on the move, that Jesus, you are still on the move in our hearts and through our lives. May Christmas truly be about the Christ, the Son of God, the good, good Savior of this world, and the good friend, healer, and hope bringer that we all need. In Jesus' name we pray.